voters should play a critical role in democracy. You know, our founders actually worked well before 1920. They started in 1848 with the Seneca Falls Convention and Elizabeth Cady Stanton brought women together for the first time to talk about the women's right to vote. The mission of the League of Women Voters is to essentially inform, educate, engage, and empower voters. Next slide, please. This evening, Mary Ann, Penny, and I are going to delve into two major topics with you. The first is the essentials of voting, and then we're going to pursue an initial exploration of propositions and bills. Please advance to the next slide. So here's a little warm up activity. This is a short quiz, and if you would start the poll and take a moment to answer these three questions, and then we're going to take a look at your responses and segue into the next part, which is women and voting. Just let me know when you have the results. Yes, I'll let you know when everybody has voted. Okay. Leah, I assume you don't want us to vote because we already know the answers, correct? No, yes, yeah, you're, okay. to you're totally fine. We're waiting for one more to vote. All right, perfect. You see the results? I see the results. Perfect. Awesome. Very good on that first one. When did women get the vote nationally? Women received the vote nationally on August 18th, 1920. When was the League of Women Voters founded? Oh, here we have kind of a split. The League was founded on February 14th, 1920, which was several months before the ratification of the 19th Amendment on August 18th, 1920. When did women get the vote in Arizona? Women got the vote in Arizona on November 5th, 1912. So Arizona was before the United States ratification of the 19th Amendment. And there were Western states that had given women the right to vote or had voted to, men had voted to give women the right to vote before the 19th Amendment in 1920. Now, this next question, you can uh, remove the poll. This next question, I want you to think about this for a minute. What do you think gave women the right to vote in the state of Arizona? And just think about that for a moment. You don't have to put it in the chat and you don't have to express it verbally. Just Think about it yourself. Next slide, please. No one gave Arizona women the right to vote. They fought for it. Our foremothers fought for it. So here's a brief view of women's suffrage in the state of Arizona. And remember that the Seneca Falls Convention, which started the whole conversation, happened in New York in 1848. So there was quite a bit of activity before things started to happen in the state of Arizona in 1866. 
and the Arizona became a state, so it was a territory in 1866. By 1912, it had become a state on Valentine's Day. And Valentine's Day is the same day in 1920 that the League of Women Voters was established. And you have something really interesting here on the right hand side. There is the original um, information about the initiative to establish the right to vote for women in the state of Arizona. And I guess that's our foremothers up there riding through the territory, just like Paul Revere saying, women get the right to vote, pay attention. If you wanna know more about women's suffrage, a great site is the Arizona Library. Next slide, please. So as an introduction here, why do you vote? And one of the things that happens when we uh, engage in in-person voter registration activities and events, and we have an opportunity to actually interact face-to-face -face with prospective voters, some of them say, oh, I don't want to vote. You know, my vote doesn't count. My voice doesn't matter. And we talk about the following. Voting is your right and it's your duty. It's a responsibility to fulfill in a free and democratic society. It's your voice that matters. And many elections are won by a handful of votes. In fact, there are times when an election can be won by one or two votes. It's happened in the Virginia General Assembly where one vote made the difference between one party having the majority than the other. So your vote does count. And when you get to local elections, it really, really counts. They're very, very important because it's your opportunity to have your voice heard around local issues and candidates who will represent you in your city council, in your county board of supervisors, uh, your mayors, really important that your, your, vo your vote counts. Now people say, oh, you know, I, I don't vote. Well, guess what? When you don't vote, you're making a decision because you're giving someone else the right to make decisions for you. So your voice does matter. There's an urban myth that's circulating around that people share with us when we're doing voter registration and they say, oh, no, I don't want to register to vote because you're going to call me for jury duty off my voter registration. Well, actually, the truth is that jury pools are determined by your driver's license and the voter registration database, and they're selected by a random process. So just because you registered to vote is not an automatic line to serving on a jury. But I would say that serving on a jury, just like voting, is part of a responsibility to fulfill in a free and de democratic society. And ballot propositions, which appear on the uh, ballot in the general election coming up, there will be several, they're really important for you to pay attention to because this is your voice on many issues that will impact you because it creates law and you have an opportunity to have your voice heard. And Penny's gonna talk in much more detail about that. So remember that our foremothers fought long and hard for this right. And as Susan B. Anthony, who was an early suffragette says to us, someone struggled for your right to vote, use it. Next slide, please. Here's some interesting data for you to take a look at. Unpacking the women's vote. If you look at the first graph on the left-hand side, you will see that nationally, women turn out to vote at higher rates than men. In the past midterms, women turned out at slightly higher rates than men. And if you look at the share of the electorate, electorate in 2018, which was our last um, midterm elections, 53% of the voters were women. Nationally, older women turn out at higher rates than younger women. But younger voters 
have a turnout that is increasing. And if you look at the first section of that chart on the far left, and you see ages 18 to 24, and 25 to 34, and 35 to 44, as you go across, you'll see that the projection up is sharp. More younger women are voting. It's your right, it's your duty, please vote. Next slide, please. Now we're gonna to turn to how do you register vote? And Marianne will be walking you through some very important information. Marianne? Okay, thank you, Gail. After hearing why it's so important to vote, I'd like to take you through some essential information on how to register and how to vote. So Penny, next slide, please. Okay, to register to vote in Arizona, you must be a US citizen. You must be an Arizona resident in the county listed on your registration, and you must be 18 years old by the date of the election. Younger voters um, can register earlier as long as they'll be 18 on election day. Also, convicted felons with their rights restored may be able to vote in Arizona, and they should contact the Arizona Secretary of State for details and uh, help in this area. So right now, we're in the primary election season. The deadline to register for this has already passed. Um, and uh, mail ballots have started appearing. Um, if you do not have a mail ballot, the last day to request one is July 24th, and the last day to vote is August 4th. I'll talk more about voting later. Um, so after this, the next cycle is the big one, the general election. And the last day to register or update your registration for this is October 5th. Um, and of course, election day is November 3rd. Um, and that's the last day at which you can vote. Next slide, please, Penny. So how to register. All right, you may have seen in the past the League of Women Voters uh, staffing a table at some event at your grocery store or whatever. Um, we like to be out there, but we're not out there right now um, because of, of COVID concerns. Um, so we're not doing registration in person. Um, <clears throat> it's also possible to register in person at your county recorder's office or at the motor vehicle department. Um, but right now the hours and services available by these offices uh, may be curtailed. So the league is recommending other options at this time. Um, you can request a registration form by mail. If you go to the Secretary of State's office, there's a, a printable form there you can download and print. You can call election services at 1-877-THE-VOTE. You can also call your county recorder and have them mail you a form to register or update your registration. Um, finally, you can register or update your registration directly online. And the league is participating in a program with the Secretary of State's office that takes you directly to the Service Arizona portal for uh, registration and provides us information for voter outreach. So this is a shortened version, the bit.ly LWVAZ vote. And uh, we are recommending online methods right now as the best procedure. So for online registration, you need either a valid Arizona driver's license or a non-operating license. And these are the most common forms of, of proof for registration. Um, there are other, other forms of proof that are allowed, uh, but copies of these must be mailed. So you need to do a mail-in system. You can use something like a birth certificate verifying your citizenship. If your name has changed, for example, through marriage, um, you need supporting documents. You can use pertinent pages of a passport. You can use naturalization documents, tribal ID. And um, the Arizona Clean Election site has um, a very good section on all types of proof that can be used and details. Uh, the most important thing to remember, though, is whichever method you choose, you must complete any updates to your registration by October 5th to be able to vote in the general election. That's a hard and fast deadline. You need to make your updates by then. Okay, next slide, please, Penny. Um, so as you've seen, there are a number of ways to register and steps to accomplish this. But fortunately, there are also a number of online resources to help. 
we have many resources here in Arizona. Sometimes it's a little confusing to figure out which one to use. So the one we're recommending, um, as I mentioned, is LWVAZ Vote. And as you can see here, it takes you directly to the Service Arizona portal, to the place where you select your language, either English or Spanish. And then it takes you through the process, it steps you through the process to either register or update your registration. Arizona Clean Elections is a really great site for further information. Um, and I encourage you to consult with this. I'm gonna to refer to it later in the presentation, but you can see information on registering, elections, how to vote, how government works, where to vote. It's a really well done and very useful site. And then finally, the National League of Women Voters Organization um, has a site that covers many, many aspects of voting. It's Vote 411, sort of all things voting. And um, I like to point this site out because one of the things that it has is a printable version of the National Voter Registration Form in 15 different languages. So if you need some language help or you're, you're helping another citizen that needs some language help uh, in completing this form, this can be a really great resource. Okay, next slide, please, Kenny. All right, well, maybe you're not sure if your registration is up to date. Uh, suppose you've registered in the past, but you don't quite recall, did I change my address? Um, do you know whether you're on the Pebble or not? Um, again, there's another very useful site to help you with this. It's called my.arizona.vote. Um, go to the site. There are a number of things you can accomplish, and the one I've highlighted here is search for your voter registration. A little window will pop up where you fill in your information, driver's license, birthday, and such. And then you get a printout of your voter information. And this is my personal one. And as you can see, I'm a registered voter in Yavapai County, and I'm on the Pebble. And you can be too. Um, so the Pebble, you may have been hearing a lot about this lately. Um, it's the permanent early voting list. When you're on this, every ballot comes direct to your mailbox. I like to think of it a take home, like a take home test. You know, you can research candidates, you can research issues, uh, and then you can make an informed vote. And in the time of COVID, it um, reduces your exposure at polls. And also there's problems getting poll workers in Arizona because many poll workers are retired and are concerned about exposure. So um, this is a really great uh, way to go. So how do you get on the pebble? If you're registering for the first time, uh, you will have been given an option to get on the PEPL as part of the process. Um, be sure to select it. If you're already registered and um, you, you haven't requested the PEPL yet, you can use a printed form. Again, this particular form can be found on the Secretary of State's office. Call the recorder, call 1-877-THE-VOTE, request a form, fill it out, and mail it back. You can also go through the LWVAZ vote portal that takes you to the Service Arizona, go through the process like as if you're registering again, and when you get to the select pebble, make sure you check that. Um, Arizona, we're quite lucky here. We have a, a very long, secure history of mail voting, and I really encourage you to join the pebble, join the approximately 80% of other Arizona voters who have already chosen to use this process. Um, so if you're not on it, I'd really encourage it. Next slide, please, Kenny. So I'd like to, uh, before I leave a discussion of voter registration, I'd like to talk through some uh, particular issues for college students, if you're one yourself or you have a family member who's a college student. Um, your registration decision may consider where you will be living and what you consider to be your registration address at the time of the vote. If you'll be living at college and you wish to vote in this election district, um, you must update your registration to reflect this address by the, by the uh, registration deadline. The easiest way to do this is to call your county recorder at the same time they can answer any questions for you and send you whatever form you would need. Um, if you don't wanna vote from your college address, you can continue to vote from your family address. Let's say you're at school in NAU, your family lives in Phoenix, you really wanna vote in the Phoenix issues. Um, you can call your registrar and request a single ballot by mail that will be sent to you at your temporary college address and you can vote on those local issues from there. 
Um, one thing I like to caution, particularly for any out-of-state students or students on financial aid, be sure to check if it's going to have an impact on your financial aid status. And uh, for example, you might want to reach out and, and contact your college uh, student aid office. Um, when you vote, election security is an important issue and voting at the polls requires that you have an ID with address matching your registration. This might be a little bit complicated for college student issues. And there's a super page on the Arizona Clean Election, a, a youth voter site that addresses that exactly. If you vote by Pebble, um, then the election security is, is handled by your signature match. Okay, so you're registered, you're ready to undertake the right and duty to vote, and there, again, are a number of ways to do this. Next slide, please. Okay, you may, of course, vote in person at the polls. Remember, you need to bring proper photo ID with you. Uh, voting in person can be slightly different depending on the county where you live. Some counties have voting centers and any voter can go to any center in the county. Other counties have specific polling places that depend on your address. Um, and you must go to that polling place because only they will have immediate access to your registration record that will allow you to vote. Again, Arizona Clean Elections is an excellent voter dashboard um, that allows you to check your voting site. Go there, pop in your address, and it's going to tell you exactly if you have a polling place, if you have voting centers. And it's my belief, and when Kami speaks, she can correct me, but I believe Maricopa is going all the voting centers. Um, okay, in the time of COVID, a number of voters uh, might have concerns about health issues, and they really don't want to be exposed to crowds at the polls. So um, the league is encouraging voters to consider other options. You may vote early in person. Um, you can do this up until Friday before the election day, but I, again, would encourage you to uh, contact your local recorder um, because uh, sites and times may vary, especially right now. For example, some offices are not open on Fridays and they may have reduced hours. But still, if you like to vote in person, we encourage people to do this because you can do it under not crowded conditions. As I've mentioned previously, you may vote by mail, by a single request uh, for a specific election, or you can vote by mail because you're on the pebble. And we really think that's the best way. We, we like to people to go that route. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, now I'd like to talk to you about some of the specifics of Pebble voting. Um, when voting your Pebble, please read the instructions carefully. Uh, the most important point is to sign the affidavit. If you've used a Pebble before, that little white envelope, big stop sign, sign the affidavit. Without a signature, your vote will not be counted. Um, and here's a point for professional women. Be sure to use the name and signature on your driver's license or your registration. For example, many professional women might have uh, one name for their private life and one name for their professional life. Make sure you sign it with whatever signature you used on your driver's license or your um, voter registration. Then the next thing to do is mail your ballot. Be careful, postmarks do not apply. This is not like filing your taxes where you can rush into the post office at the last minute on April 15th. It has to be, it has to be received at the recorders by the election day. At the league, we're recommending for safety, mail it early, 10 days ahead of the election at least is what we recommend. If you miss this deadline or you just want added security, you can drop your signed uh, sealed ballot at a voting box. These are secure drop-off locations and call your county recorder or check their website to find out where these locations are. Finally, you can take your voted, signed, and sealed ballot to a, your poll or your voting center up until 7 p.m. on election day. That's another very important point that many people don't realize. The Postal Service does not forward the pebble. If you've moved, you have to update your registration. If you're gonna be temporarily away, so you have a, a second home, you're on a long family vacation, you can have a single ballot mailed to that temporary location, even if it's out of state. If you're gonna be in Atlanta for a month, 
you can, you can have your Pebble ballot mailed there. Finally, after you've mailed it, if you want to know if your Pebble has been received, have they gotten it, have they counted it, you can go to the My Arizona, my.arizona.vote portal and look at the tab that says Valify, Verify Your Ballot by Mail Status, and you can see that they've received it and counted it. Okay, next slide is for um, specific information for independent voters. These are non-party affiliated voters. You are important. Make your voice heard. 32% of registered voters in Arizona are independent. Arizona, the August 4th primary, is, is an open primary for Democratic, for the Democratic and the Republican parties. All registered non-party affiliated voters, the independents can participate. So in order to do this, you must choose a D or R ballot for the August 4th primary. If you're on the Pebble or you want a mail ballot, you make this request for D or R by July 24th. Contact your recorder to do this, or perhaps you've already sent in the Pebble form that was mailed to you with this information. If you miss this deadline, you can still vote in person, or if you vote in person, you may request DRR directly at the early voting site or at the polls. Um, and for some local races, you can even get a nonpartisan ballot, it's very specific to local races. Uh, I'd also like you to note for you that choosing D or R does not change your party affiliation. Um, you still remain independent for all local elections. And there's a lot of confusion around that, but if you are an in independent, make your voice heard. Okay, next slide, Penny. Okay, we've covered registration. Um, we've got through the mechanics of voting. Now comes the final step, being an informed voter. Um, studies show that many people don't vote because they feel they do not have enough information to make an informed choice. And I'd like to point out that I think this is really for me, one of the advantages of the Pebble is I can sit down and I can look at my ballot and I can search as much as I want, particularly the ballot propositions. That was a real plus to me when I moved to Arizona. Um, Arizona Clean Elections, again, has very useful um, information. There's a voting informed site that has all sorts of things here, information on candidates, ballot propositions, they will update that as propositions are added. There's a very useful voter education guide. Uh, Be Ballot Ready is an excellent site for Maricopa residents with both state and local information. The league runs many candidate forums. Uh, many of these are recorded and are available to watch at your leisure. Check your local league sites and a couple of additional sites um, that you might wish to explore that are useful are Ballotopedia and and vote smart and all of these are nonpartisan sites so they will give you information on both sides of an issue and both both of the major party candidates and um, I'd like to close this section um, with a statement encouraging you to vote informed with a quote from JFK the ignorance of one voter in a democracy impairs the security of all um, so thank you for listening and uh, thank you for voting Thank you so much, Marianne and Gail. Um, of course, that was a quite a bit of information, but valuable information. I do want to see if there are any questions. Um, if not, I will definitely move forward with uh, propositions and bills. There will be a small time for questions at the end too, as well. A brief um, introduction about Penny. So Penny Sharon. Um, currently serves on the League of Women Voters of Arizona State Board as the advocacy chair um, and is the president-elect of, of the local league chapter um, of Metro Phoenix. She has been active in the league since 2015 in her role as the advocacy chair. She leads a group of dedicated and committed advocates guided by the, league, by the League of Women Voters positions to stay vigilant and speak for or against legislation and government actions. So um, Penny, please take it away. Thank you so much for coming on. Thank you, Aaliyah, and thank you to my colleagues, Marianne and Gail, for their excellent presentation. So in the time that we have, I am going to delve into propositions and bills. 
uh, now that you know to know how to vote, what's important to understand is how powerful your vote is in both determining the laws that impact your everyday lives and in determining who makes those laws. So we're going to jump into this. Um, <clears throat> What is really important for you to know from a historical perspective is that Arizona allows initiatives and referendums as well as legislative measures to be placed on a ballot by a special commission. Now, the initiative requirement is that 10% is required if it is a statutory, which means it's part of the state law, and a 15% uh, of the uh, the 15% of the number of people who voted in the last election. So it's 10% of the number of people who voted in the last election and 15% of the number of people who voted in the last election. That's the number of signatures that have to be gathered uh, in order to change either the state law or to impact or to implement a new state law or to change uh, uh, the constitution or uh, uh, in other words, amend the constitution. So this right of citizens is what I call direct democracy. You get to make the law and you get to make the law because you vote, because you sign petitions and because you're active in this process. Now, when did we get this right to be able to do that? Believe it or not, this has been in our constitution since 1912. To a large extent, we are the envy of many, many states that had to fight for the citizens' right to de direct democracy. So in 1911, it was adopted, okay? And we are allowed to do initiatives and referendums, constitutional amendments, statutory amendments, and we can do it either directly or indirectly. And if we do it directly, uh, we can do it through uh, ballot initiatives. If we do it indirectly, it is through our representatives, but they cannot make changes to the constitution. That requires citizens' direct involvement. So um, I wanted to be sure you all were really tuned into, we have some immense power in our hands that we as citizens should exercise. So um, one of the confusing parts of this is what's an initiative, what's a proposition, what's a ballot? And I think this will, stay, this will provide you some clarity. The process by which we say we want something into law is really the initiative process. The language that we put in the initiative process is what we call the proposition. So it is, we're gonna start a process, we're gonna propose law number X, and then guess what? We as voters are gonna vote it in or vote against it because sometimes propositions come forward that can be harmful to citizens and the interests might not be in the best interests of the uh, citizens. So it's important to understand initiative is process, proposition is content, and ballot is the vote. So you can see why the voting is so important. Well, how does it actually come about? So guess what? A, Campaign committee is formed to draft a proposition. We'll talk a little bit more about how those campaign committees formed. You actually have to get the proposition um, approved through the Secretary of State and, and a group called the Legislative Council. They have to look at the language, make sure it's legally correct, make sure it meets all the requirements before you can go out and then you go gather signatures. Remember, 15% if you're trying to re repeal or put in a new law at the state level, uh, sorry, 10%, and 15% if you're trying to make a change to the Constitution. 15 and 10% of what? The number of people who voted in the last election. So in 2018, we had a great increase in the number of people who voted. So guess what? We've got to collect a whole lot more signatures than we did in 2016. Once the signatures have been gathered, anticipate legal fights, battles, challenges, because there are forces for and against it. But at some point, it's either going to get certified for the ballot or not. 
And then the hard work begins, which is we get into action and the league takes an active part, depending on the propositions we support, to get out the vote, to get people to support the proposition. Once that proposition has been approved by the voters, it wins in the vote, then it becomes law. And here is something really important for you to know. The citizens actually passed an initiative, and I don't have the exact date in front of me, that basically says that the legislature or the governor cannot recall a change, an initiative that was passed into law by the citizens. Only the citizens can do that. So um, there have been attempts, for example, to recall the uh, a wage increase, the minimum wage increase. There are groups that are really against it, but the legislature cannot do it, nor can the governor do that. So it's really important to understand the power we have. Now, this I'm going to show you just as a simple example. We, not, I cannot tell you whether these uh, ballot propositions are going to show up or not, because the signatures are still being vetted. They are going to go through some court challenges. And so if they should pass, this is kind of how it works, is that there'll be a name for the initiative, there'll be a topic that's tied to it, and a number is assigned. This ID tells you it's met the requirements of the Legislative Council and the Secretary of State. These are citizen-initiated ballots. So that's our indirect democracy. In addition to that, what people don't often realize is that the legislature can pass what are called resolutions. And what these resolutions do is to essentially allow the legislature to write ballot initiatives that will show up on your ballot, but none of these have the influence of any citizens, no signature is required by any citizens, and the hard work to fight this happens after it gets on the ballot, okay? So there are a number of these bills. These are all the bills that were looked at in this last legislative session. None of them were passed because the legislative session ended or adjourned sine die, which means it adjourned abruptly because of the COVID-19 situation, which is in a way a good thing because so many of these would have truly impacted our right to vote, our right for to so many things that we as citizens care about. So um, this is an example for us as voters to understand ballots can come forward and you never signed a single signature, you never signed a single initiative gatherer, uh, initiative um, paperwork in order for that uh, to show up on the ballot. Now I'm going to move on to uh, actual legislation. So there are two ways laws are passed. One is direct democracy, where you as the citizen bring forward ballot initiatives and we vote for it. Second is indirect. So the indirect method is we vote for legislators. Legislators then pass laws that may be in your best interest or not. So guess what? Your vote counts. Those very narrow elections can change who is in legislature and what kind of bills are brought forward and how they get voted. A very quick example of why your vote matters. If there are bills, for example, there were numerous bills that are important for us as voters, the right to vote, the freedom to vote, the flexibility of voting, mail-in votes, um, uh, school of funding, all of those bills never got heard because the legislature is controlled by a group of, by one side of the aisle that essentially determines that that's not of interest to them. It's of interest to the citizens, but it's not for them, and they control what gets read and how it becomes the law. So why, why do they have so much power? Uh, we have a saying in business, as we do in other uh, thing, uh, in other agencies, is, he who sets the agenda controls the conversation, and that's what goes on in this uh, legislature when we don't have proper representation. So how does it get started? It starts with the issues that influence. So citizens may say, look, 
you know, um, X is a real issue in our communities. We want laws that protect members in our communities. So we want laws that ensure this. In, um, for example, the, um, um, the, there were uh, interest in um, the uh, passage of uh, legislation that would um, help the schools in funding, that would ensure that teachers had more uh, access to resources. Well, those are citizens who were speaking up to influence the legislators. We also have people with uh, money that we don't know who they are and who they're giving the money to that come forward with legislation. There are groups, an example of his group called the Heritage Foundation. There's a group called the, um, uh, uh, the, um, the uh, American Legislative Executive Council. They actually come up with laws. Some of these groups are determined to suppress the vote. So they decide to bring forward legislation. And then a legislators' ideologies and personal modifications. For example, the number, a number of the laws tied to charter schools were tied specifically to a legislator who owned a large number of properties tied to uh, the charter schools. And there was a huge article about that in the New York Times. So, you know, these are three important things for us to be aware of as to how did that law even come into place? Now, in spite of all of this, the only way it can be put through the hopper, if you will, is that a single legislator, le legislator or legislators have to, uh, process, have to sponsor the bill. It's called sponsoring the bill. And it can be sponsored at the House or it can be sponsored at the Senate. So that process is a little complicated, but I want to be sure we understand that. Now, here is the point I want to make. We can stop or move forward good bills or stop bad bills. And how do we do that? We can give testimony at legislature. We can write to legislatures, letter, letters to the editor. We During this, um, the SOS Arizona, where they fought against the vouchers and the expansion of vouchers, guess what? You know, the teachers protested. 80,000 teachers protested on the streets, okay? And most importantly, you can decide who represents you by voting. So that is such a critical part of the power of your vote. Um, how is the bill created? This is a repeat of what I've said before, so I'm going to go past this. But what I want to pay attention to at this point is that this step of legislators meeting with stakeholders to discuss ideas is unfortunately been tremendously circumvented. An example is a number of bills came through the legislature this year that had such a negative impact on tribal communities. And during the hearings, there was no effort made by any of the legislators who brought forward that legislation to meet with any of the leaders of the tribal communities. And I share this because Normally, good legislators would meet with all the stakeholders. What we have now is a process where only special interests are met with and bills are being brought forward. I'm going to move on to the complicated process by which a bill is um, comes through the hopper. As somebody said, you want, don't want to know how the sausage is made. So here's an example of it's, it's, it's complicated how the bill goes through. But I want you to know there are 10 steps that generally a bill follows, okay? And there are some variations. There are some nuanced, problematic areas. But these are very simple steps that you should be aware of. A uh, bill is assigned to a committee. If bill is not assigned to a committee, it is never going to get heard. So a ton of good bills were never assigned to a community committee because the, peop the legislature in power did not want it to be heard. But if it is assigned to a committee, there's a first reading, a second reading, and then the committee has a hearing. That in, art, uh, in red is exactly the point. Number three is when we as citizens can speak up against a bill. So that's our first opportunity. Then it goes into a second reading. Then there are caucuses. There's a third reading. Now what happens is we have the House and the Senate. If a bill starts in the House, it has to be um, 
uh, it has to go through the process in the Senate. And if in the Senate, it is as a bill has started, it has to go to the process in the House. That's called crossing the courtyard. Once the bills have crossed the courtyard, again, we have committee hearings. Another chance again for citizens to speak up. If we aren't able to prevail at that level, our final chance is get to the governor so that he doesn't sign the bill. Okay, that's our next step. Um, there, are, who influences all of this? I kind of touched on this, but I would like you to note that there are lots of power players. There are politicians, lobbyists, advisors, donors, corporations. And what is really telling is missing is everyday citizens. So folks, our vote is the only way we can have some influence. Now, two more things, and we're getting close to being done so that, Aliyah, we meet your timeline. And that is that I spoke about how, how do we actually n learn about these bills? How can we go about finding about these bills? Well, the first thing I want to tell you is you would go to a site called azleg.gov. I am not going to do a demo because we don't have enough time, Aliyah, and I want to open it up for questions. But what happens when you get to this site, and I would love for us to have a more in-depth explanation later on, but when we get to this site, there are two things you can do. You can inquire about a particular bill, which is called the bill number, and it'll tell you information about that bill. Or remember those three, two times when U.S. citizens can speak up? We in Arizona have many, many unique things that actually allow citizens to participate only if we could participate. Number one is the ballot initiatives. Number two is our ability as citizens to actually speak up against or for bills. And we do it by participating on an, in an online system called Request to Speak. You have to get an account, you want a little bit of training, and Aliyah, if your group decides this is what they wanna do, we would be very happy as an advocacy group, we do this all the time to help you get on board so you are far more active and your group is far more active in this space, okay? Okay, I'm going to stop, Aliyah. I want to be sensitive to your time and open up to if you have questions. And if anybody wants to uh, volunteer or get involved more into the organization, can they contact one of those emails or do they go directly on your site? If they want to get involved with the organization, they have two ways to do that. They should go to the website and join. Okay, and the website is lwbaz.org or send a request to the LWB Arizona and they will get a response. Um, if nobody has any questions, going once, going twice. Okay, thank you so much for everyone that stayed on to listen to this fantastic presentation. Thank you so much for the League of Women Voters. We are honored to have you on. Um, so thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you.